Oh, good. All right, Hunter. Hi, Hunter. How are we doing? Give me one second, Professor. I'll be right back. No problem. Okay, I got 90 in here. 10. Grace is here. How about wonderful? Um, sorry, one second. I need to grab my. Hey, Grace. Give me a visual, guys. Uh, professor, I just got in here. I'm in the bathroom at the moment, but I will. I don't want a visual, guys. Okay. Sorry, I'm just getting myself situated. <laughs> just get myself situated here. Okay, we all ready to get started here? Ready as well for me. Oh, good. Believe me, getting done fast at this lab is wonderful for me too. There's a whole bunch going on in this lab. We have stoichiometry. We have limiting reagents. We have gas loss. There is a little bit of everything in this lab and it's a pain in the butt to describe. But we'll get through it, guys. We will get through it, okay? Uh, Hunter, you back. Hunter, now well, Hunter's going to have to wait for a few seconds. Then, or are you seeing the slideshow, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. yes sir. All right, wonderful, Peach Cane. Wonderful. Okay. So, actually, this is kind of an exciting lab because basically, what you're doing is you're doing the volcano experiment which basically almost everybody's done where you stick sodium baking or you sit baking soda, mix it with vinegar and you see a whole bunch of bubbles come up. Same thing's going to happen here. Only instead of using baking soda, you're using a uh, uh, sodium bicarb or sodium carbonate. Sodium carbonate as opposed to bicarbonate, you're still producing carbon dioxide. And the whole thing is, what you do is you start these things going and the balloons are tied down to the flask and you see these things starting to expand and it is wonderfully exciting as I'm sure you can tell with my wonderful, wonderful thing going on here. All right, review. If you haven't heard it from me, if you, guys in lecture, this has gone on ad nauseum. Stoichiometry is a three-step process. Turn your known into moles. Then turn your known moles into unknown moles using the molar ratio. Then what you do is you turn your moles if you're unknown into what the question asks you to determine. So if we're dealing with step one, guys, you have a lot of tools in your belt right now. By tools, you have the tools to make moles. So the first step is to turn your known sample into moles. If you're given grams, you multiply it by one gram over the molecular mass. If you're given liters of a gas at SDP, you multiply it by one mole over 22.414. If you're given the concentration and the volume, you turn your volume into liters, then multiply it by the, uh, uh, wait a second. Oh, I'm sorry. Lost my train of thought for a second. If you're given the volume and the concentration, you turn your volume into liters, multiply that by molarity, you have moles. Last, if you have the pressure, volume, and temperature of a gas, you can use the ideal gas law and take the pressure times the volume, divide that by the constant R times the temperature, you will get moles. 
Is there anybody here that hasn't been exposed to the gas laws yet? I don't think I've gone over the gas laws yet in my uh, lecture. Okay, Jeff, you're going to have to bear with me then, okay? You're going to have to realize that the ideal gas law is something, is a formula. If you have a gas, there are four independent properties, pressure, volume, temperature, and moles. These are all interrelated into something called the ideal gas law. PV is equal to NRT. Pressure times volume is equal to moles N times R, a constant, times temperature. Okay, you with me on that, Jeff? Makes sense? Yeah, it's actually Philip, but yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so right now, guys, you have four ways of making moles. You can use any one of these, and it doesn't matter. Moles are moles are moles. It doesn't matter how you got them. If they're moles, they are moles. So our second step, we're going to use the molar ratio to turn the moles of our known into moles of our unknown. I have a chemical equation here. Now using the molar ratio means nothing more than you look at a balanced chemical equation. And all you're gonna do is put the coefficient of what you want of the coefficient of your known. If you have moles of NaCl and you want moles of lead chloride, lead four chloride, well then the coefficient in front of the lead chloride is one, coefficient in front of the NaCl is four. If you're starting with moles of NaCl, you're gonna multiply that by one mole of lead four chloride over four moles NaCl, that will give you your moles of lead four chloride. Review. Everybody good with this? Is this making sense to everybody? Fine as kind. Now, and I know, big long slide, right? Whole bunch of stuff. But it's a whole big long slide because you got to know what they want. Remember, we just made moles of our unknown. So we got to look at the question and see what the question is asking us for. If it wants the grams of the unknown, we have moles, multiply it by one mole over the molecular mass. I'm sorry, excuse me. Multiply it by the molecular mass over one mole. If the question asks you for liters at SDP, you're going to multiply it by 22.414 over one mole. If you want the concentration, you're going to take your moles and divide it by the volume in liters. The problem's going to give you the volume. If you want the liters, you're going to take the moles, and divide it by the molarity. The molarity will be given to you in the formula. Now, we have four parameters for the ideal gas law, pressure, volume, moles, and temperature. If we want the pressure, the ideal gas law, the problem will give us volume and temperature. We just figured out moles. Use the three of them to figure out the pressure. If you want the volume, use the moles, temperature, and pressure to figure out the volume. And if I want the temperature, I'm going to use the ideal gas law where I'm going to take my pressure that's given, the volume that's given, and divide it by NR. And that will give me my temperature. We got a problem here. 40 grams of sodium chloride is added to an excess of lead nitrate in 40 milliliters. What is the concentration of my lead chloride. Do we have the ability to get moles of something here? Yes. What is it? You have to convert the grams to moles. Using the molecular weight. So I have my 40 grams of sodium chloride. I'm going to multiply that by my 
one over my molecular weight. This gives me 0.6845 moles. Do I have the molar ratio? Yes. Somebody other than Victoria, give me the molar ratio here. Sorry, Victoria. It's okay. I'm used to being banned. Thanks. On, on the bottom, you have four moles of sodium chloride. And on the top, you would have uh, one mole of uh, lead four chlorate. There we go. So I've just turned my moles of of sodium chloride, my 0.6848 moles of sodium chloride into 0.1711 moles of lead chloride. Now, guys, what is the question asking us for? Concentration of it. Concentration of it. I've got moles. In order to get concentration, I need moles per liter. Do I have a way of getting the liters? Yes. Somebody other than Victoria. Well, you know that there's 40 milliliters of solution. So you, you, you can convert milliliters to liters. Yep, I'm trying, I'm trying to get out of this. I'm gonna take convert my milliliters to liters and then I'm gonna take my moles divided by my liters and this is gonna give me the concentration. Now, there is a special kind of stoichiometry problem. In this problem, you're going to be given a way to get moles of two different reactants. The thing about it is one of the reactants is going to run out before the other. So the one that runs out limits the amount of product you're able to produce. So the strategy we have, we're going to figure out how much product each one will make. The one that makes the smaller amount came from the limiting reagent. That's the one we're going to use. Okay, new problem. I got 75.82 grams of sodium chloride. I react it with 147 grams of lead four nitrate. How many grams of the lead four nitrate can I make? All right, step one. Only in this case, instead of finding the moles of one of my reactants, I have to find the moles of both. So I'm going to take the grams and divide it by my molecular weight. I got 1.300 moles of sodium chloride, 0.323 moles of lead for nitrate. What's the next step I got to do? Molar ratio. Is it the same? No. What is it? For which one? You tell me. Pick one. Uh, we'll, we'll go with uh, sodium chloride first then, I guess. Okay. And uh, that one's going to be uh, four on the bottom, four moles of sodium chloride on the bottom to uh, uh, one mole of the lead chlorate on top. You know, Jeff. Yeah, you know, you know oh, Jeff. Yes. The way the way you say these things, you say, you you start with the bottom, and I'm like, I'm all prepared. I'm just anxious. I'm ready to jump down your throat. No, no, no. But you're absolutely right. It is four on the bottom, one on the top. Absolutely correct, Jeff. Somebody give me the other molar ratio. The other molar ratio would be, would be one to one. One to one. So I'm going to take those two molar ratios and multiply them by my two moles. This gives me 0 0.3250 moles of lead chloride, lead four chloride, or 0.323 moles of lead four chloride. Which one is smaller? Point three two five. 0.325 is smaller than 0.323. I want to take you out to Vegas with me. Sorry, I was looking at the front. I had the chat bar, um, not the chat bar, but the, the video. <laughs> I was looking at the front. I still oh want to take you to Vegas with me. Okay. I'll go. 
All right, we got 0.323 made the smaller amount. So that's the amount we report out. All we got to do is take the one, the 0.323 forward. And it asked me, question asked me to determine the grams of lead four chloride. I have the moles, I have the molecular formula. I can get the molecular weight from the molecular formula. Multiply that by the moles, I get 113 grams of lead four chloride. I'm hoping this is review for you guys. I'm hoping this is a real nice, solid review for you all. If you're not understanding what I'm saying, just kind of stick around and ask me after the, after the session's over. I'll be happy to go through this with you again. All right, now we're gonna get into something that kind of resembles a little bit of what we're doing here. You got four grams of aluminum in 300 milliliters of, of 1.25 molar HCl. How many liters of H2 do you generate if the pressure of the H2 is, 100, is 840 torr at 25C? You got to look, I have grams of one compound. I can make moles of aluminum. I have milliliters and concentration of the other one. I can make moles of both. So I got to find the moles of each one. How do I do that? Somebody other than Jeff. Am, am I allowed to speak again? No. Okay. Never again. No, thank you, Victoria. I'm trying to get others involved. I understand. Do I have to start calling on people? It makes things go ever so much slowly. You can find moles of aluminum by thank dividing, you. dividing grams by the molecular weight and yeah. So how about the other one, Philip? Uh, what? For how about the other one? How do I find moles of HCl? Um, you already have moles of HCl. No, I don't. Have you done solution chemistry yet, Philip? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You um, you have molarity, right? Have molarity, and I have. So you'll you'll divide it by. No. Nope. No, you multiply it by liters. I multiply. I change the three hundred into liters. Then I multiply that by the concentration. Come on. So I'm going to take my aluminum, multiply it by one mole over the molecular weight. I got 0 0.150 moles of aluminum. Change my 300 milliliters into liters. Multiply that by 1.25. I got 0.375 moles of HCl. Now, what do I do? What's my second step? Am I gonna have to ferret you guys out? I'll do it, I'll thre I'm will i threatening here. Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Um, I'm helping my mom cook, but I'm still paying attention. So just give me a second. <laughs> All right, I'll get back to you. You know, this is, Zoom has made life so much interesting. Faith. Yes. How do I, what's the next step? I just turn my grams of aluminum into moles. I turn my volume and concentration of HCl into moles. What do I do now? Um, I'm sorry, I need a second. <laughs> no problem, Faith. Can we plug it into the equation and then kind of like deduce what we need to do next? Well, Andrew, but Hunter. Is it the moles uh, known to mole, whatever, that one? I call it the mole relationship. Okay, mole relationship. Mm -hmm. Monica, what is the mole relationship? All right. Do I know? Uh, 
So we can start off, I guess, because we're <clears throat> basically, we know we have aluminum and we have HCl. You already turned each one into moles and you're trying yeah. to get to H2, right? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, just one second. I just, you're absolutely right. Pardon me, I have something to say. Don't we choose the smaller amount of moles? And Not yet. Not yet. Wow. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to find where I need to be. Trying to find the original question, which is back here somewhere. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. All right, the original question. Is that the original question? Okay, the original question is, how many liters of H2 do you generate? That is the original question. I know what my, I know what my pressure is. I know what my temperature is. In order to figure out liters, I got to figure out moles of H2. So yes, Monica. We are going to we are going to take our moles of AL and make moles of H2 out of that. What is the molar relationship? So if we start with the aluminum, then you know that would go on the bottom and it would be two. And then we're trying to get to H2, so it'd be the three on the top. Okay, absolutely. Thank you very much, Monica. <laughs> and I'm gonna see who else I can get out here. Miriam, Miriam rather, Miriam. Yes. Can you tell me what the molar ratio is between my other reagent, my HCl and H2? Um. Okay, so I know that you, so you do 4.04 grams. No, no, we're talking right now, Miriam, I have a specific question. I'm asking what is the molar relationship between HCl and H2? I don't, I don't know what you mean. Okay, in order to go from HCl to H2, I have to multiply it by something, right? Um, I don't know. I'm actually really confused. Okay. That's no problem. Is it three to six? Three to six. Exactly. Sorry. Did you, who said that? So that I don't know. Was, me. It was, Mar was you, Mariam? Mar Mar no, it's it was Apple Grace. Okay. Apple Grace. Apple Grace is right. Miriam, do you see these numbers in yeah. front of the compounds? Yeah, I see that. Those are the coefficients. And what the uh, coefficients uh, stand for are the molar relationship between each of these chemicals in this particular chemical reaction. When I'm reading this chemical reaction, it's saying two moles of AL mean. react with three moles of HCl, which make two moles of aluminum chloride, and three moles of hydrogen gas. So as Apple okay, Grace it. correctly said, the relationship between HCl and H2 is three moles six. of H2 for every six moles of HCl. Okay, I understand that now. So I'm going to right now, I've got the moles of AL and moles of HCl. I'm going to change that into moles of H2. In the case of AL, there is a three to two relationship. So I multiply the 0 0.150 by three over two, I get 0.225 moles of H2. I have 0.375 moles of HCl. That molar relationship is three to six. So that gives me 0.188 moles of H2. Now, between 0 0.150 moles of AL and 0.375 moles of HCl, which one is the limiting reagent? 0 0.15. The first one. Now look, didn't the 0.15? Oh, no, no, no. The second one, the second one, I'm sorry. 
the 0.375 made less. So yeah. the 1.188 had to have come from the smaller amount, which is the limiting reagent. That's the one we report out. Now remember what our original question was. God, I hope we remember what the original question was. Leaders of H2 are created. Uh, yep. We just figured out the moles. We just figured out the moles of H2. The problem gives us the pressure and it gives us the temperature. So somebody who's had the ideal gas law, tell me what I do. Do you do the PV equals NRT and then divide Thank you, both Jennifer. sides? Thank you, Jennifer. We're going to do PV equal NRT. But in order yeah. to do PV equal NRT, if my R value, my constant, is 0 0.08206, that label is liter atmospheres per degree Kelvin mole. That means that my pressure has to be in atmospheres and my volume has to be in liters, and my temperature has to be in Kelvin. All right, so. Is that something that we're going to be given the, because, you know, I, I know where we got the moles from, and then the times, because I haven't seen that other part. You haven't seen, I'm sorry, you haven't seen the ideal gas law? Mm -mm. Nope, not yet. Okay, well, this, you this is the formula you're going to have to be given. You're going to have to you're going to have to realize that this is the formula you're going to need to calculate the volume. Okay. The formula is PV equals NRT. If I divide both sides by P, that gives me the volume, the thing I'm solving for, and that is equal to NRT divided by P. Moles are given to me. That was, yeah, right. it wasn't given to me. It's, I calculated that from my stoichiometry. Right. R is a value, 0 0.08206, but the label of R, when it is that exact value, is liter atmospheres per degree Kelvin mole. So everything in my formula has to be converted to those labels. My yeah. original temperature was 25 Celsius, I have to convert that to Kelvin, which means I have to add 273 to it. So I now have my temperature in Kelvin. My pressure was at 840 torr. I have to convert that to atmospheres. You convert it by taking 840 torr, you multiply it by one atmosphere over 760 torr, that gives me 1.11 atmospheres. So I do all this math together. I end up with my volume being 615 liters. And just to clarify, R is always 0 0.08206. It's a constant, right? It's like it, Avogadro's number, it never changes. Philip, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to do a caveat on you. Remember, I said that the label of R was liter atmospheres for degree Kelvin mole? Yeah. If you change liters to tor, then your number is going to change. If okay. you change but as the long value, as you keep it in that form. Correct. If, as long as the labels are liter atmosphere Kelvin mole, then the number for the number for R is going to be 0 0.08206. Okay, got it. Uh, one second. All right. If your number is 62.37, the label would be Tor liters per degree Kelvin mole. Does that make sense, Philip? Yeah, that makes sense. You change, you. The, you change the label, you change the number. Okay? Now, 
We're gonna get into the experiment, big picture. What you're doing, you've got five flasks, five flasks out. Into each one of these flasks, you're going to add a different mass of sodium carbonate. But to the flask, you are going to add the same amount and same con the same concentration and same volume of acetic acid. So literally speaking, what you're gonna do in this experiment, you are going to measure out, a, when you're doing this in real life, one of the partners is measuring out 100 milliliters of, of one more acetic acid, pouring it into five, pouring that amount into each of five flasks. The other partner is weighing out the sodium carbonate, putting it in, shoving it into a balloon. And then you are going to take the balloon and stretch it over the mouth of the Erlenmeyer flask. Now, basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna determine what the limiting reagent is. And when it changes from being the sodium carbonate to the acetic acid. Remember, we're using the same volume and same concentration of acetic acid. So the moles of acetic acid never changes. We keep on adding more and more sodium carbonate to each one of the flasks. Eventually what is gonna happen is the sodium carbonate is gonna be greater than the amount of acetic acid. When that happens, the limiting reagent changes. Is this making sense to you all? Yes. Okay, we're adding H, uh, acetic acid, uh, which is this big long equation, or I refer it also to HAC. We're adding acetic acid and sodium bicarbonate. And we're adding it, it occurs in these stoichiometric uh, equivalents. What we're doing is we're producing I don't want to do that, blast. We're producing acetic acid, or I'm sorry, we're producing sodium acetate, water, and carbon dioxide. So what we're doing is we're producing carbon dioxide, which is a gas. Remember, more moles, bigger volume. Avogadro said so. So as long as the moles of the limiting reagent increase, the balloon should continue to get bigger, right? But we're only increasing the sodium carbonate. So eventually the sodium carbonate is going to make the acetic acid be the limiting reagent. And since we're not putting any more acetic acid in there, eventually the balloons are going to stay the same size. Is this kind of making sense to you all? I can see that. We're dealing with a limiting reagent problem. We're given grams of sodium carbonate and we're asked to determine how much carbon dioxide you can make. We're given the molarity in the milliliters of the acetic acid. We're asked to determine how much carbon dioxide can I make? Remember, I've got 0 0.100 liters times 1.00 molar. I've got 0 0.100 moles of acetic acid in each one of my five flasks. I'm comparing the amount of carbon dioxide the acetic acid can make to the amount the sodium carbonate can make. The one that is smaller will be the limiting reagent. So we're going to determine our moles of CO2 from our limiting reagent. We are then going to try and 
predict how much volume our experiment made of CO2. We're going to do that using the ideal gas law. All right. Let's put some numbers down here. I got a one point, I weighed out 1.74 grams of sodium carbonate. I put it in a balloon, attached it to the flask, shoved it over, got all the sodium carbonate down. I got bubbles going everywhere. It's exciting. I have to predict the amount of carbon dioxide that was produced using this number. I'm going to use that and the temperature at room temperature, 295, and I'm going to use one atmosphere pressure. I'm going to use those values to predict the volume that the balloon should have. Moles of known, I got 1.74 grams of sodium carbonate. I determined moles of the known by dividing it by the molar mass. I got 0 0.0160 moles of sodium carbonate. I got 100 milliliters times 1 over 1,000 times 1 molar. I got 0 0.100 moles of HAC. Now, Hunter, Hunter, I want you to pay attention here. You there, Hunter? Hunter? I'm, I'm here. I'm I've been listening. I'm just, I'm All listening. right. I understand that, Hunter. But, Hunter, you've made this mistake several times. I want to make sure that you don't do this in the future, okay? Right. I've got moles of sodium carbonate. I got moles of H of acetic acid, right? Yep. Can I compare them one to the other? You can do a ratio. I, I can do a ratio and make out how much CO2 each will make. I could do that and then compare yeah. it. But can I care, compare moles of sodium carbonate to moles of HAC? No, they're different. They're different. So Hunter, when you're comparing them for the limiting reagent, always wait until after the molar ratio stage. OK. So my sodium carbonate as a one-to-one oh, -one relation. Go ahead, Hunter. Uh, saying I did that before, I did it before that stage. Yes, you did. You have to wait until after the molar ratio in order to do the comparison. Okay. So I've got my moles of sodium carbonate. What's the ratio between carb carbon dioxide and sodium carbonate? One to one. One to one. So if yeah. I have 0 0.016 moles of sodium carbonate, I make 0 0.0162 moles of carbon dioxide. What about acetic acid to carbon dioxide? There's two acetic acid to one carbon dioxide. So if I have 0 0.100 moles of acetic acid, I only make 0 0.050 moles of carbon dioxide. I've got a comparison here, guys. Both of these are moles of CO2. Which one is smaller? Which one is limiting? Sodium Don't be yawn. Monica, do not yawn on me. <laughs> Turning my camera off. I'm about to fall asleep. Monica, which one's smaller? <clears throat> I was just looking at it. Um, so 162, I guess the, the whatever, 0, 0,500. 0. 0.0500 is smaller mm -hmm. than 0. 0.0162? Um, oh, no, it's not. Okay. It's the opposite. Sorry. So the amount from my sodium carbonate was a smaller amount. It is limiting. That's the one I use in my ideal gas law. My PV is equal to NRT or my volume is going to be equal to NRT divided by P. My N, I just figured it out, was 0 0.0162 moles. R, 0 0.08206. 
My T, we said that was at 25 degrees Celsius or 298 Kelvin. And my P was one atmosphere. I do all that math out and I find that my volume was 396 milliliters or 396 centimeters cubed. Do I have any questions on what I've done so far, guys? Earlier, didn't you say that R is a 0.0826? 8206. 206, okay. You're going to see, Philip, if you get into the book itself and you start reading through it, they rounded it off to 0 0.0821. Okay. Just be aware of that. Okay, okay so this is the amount I predicted based upon 1.74 grams of sodium carbonate mixed with 100 milliliters of one molar acetic acid. Now I have to determine what the actual experimental value is. Now, the actual volume, if we look at this, and I'm going to get out of here for a second. And I'm gonna get into the thing because I can't, I don't have the ability to draw this picture and it makes more sense looking at it. Exactly. I feel like a visual would be a very uh, exclusive perspective of what you're trying to say, Professor. Except that a visual, <laughs> except that the visual you were going to give me earlier was not exactly what I wanted. <laughs> okay, I take that shot. <laughs> okay, so this is the actual experiment. All right, now, when we are doing this experiment, there's amount of liquid at the very bottom of the flask. So the volume of air that we need to consider is actually the volume from, the, from where the liquid ends and the very top of the flask begins. That is, this distance from here to here is 170 centimeters cubed. Then you have this little neck between the stem of the balloon. The stem of the balloon is 10 centimeters cubed. Then we have the volume of the balloon that we are going to assume is the volume of a sphere, which is uh, pi r, I'm sorry, four thirds pi r cubed. Okay? Four thirds pi r cubed is the same thing as pi diameter cubed over six. It's the same calculation. So, getting back to the slideshow. So my actual volume of the balloon is going to be the volume of the sphere, which is 4 thirds pi times r cubed. As I said, the airspace above the liquid in the flask is 170, and the airspace in the neck is 10. So the actual volume is going to be the volume of my balloon, airspace, and neck. If I measured the diameter, as 7.596, the radius, radius is half that by definition. A radius is half the diameter. So I divide the 7.596 by two, I get 3.798 centimeters. The volume of my sphere is four thirds pi r cubed. So I take four thirds times 3.14 times my radius cubed, that gives me a volume of the balloon itself of 229 centimeters. I add to that the volume in the flask and the volume in the neck. That gives me 409 centimeters cubed compared to the amount we predicted through the, through the ideal gas law. 
Yes. I realize this is a lot to deal with in this experiment. We're dealing with stoichiometry, limiting reagents. We're dealing with ideal gas law. Some of you haven't even uh, barely been into molarity and concentration. And then we're dealing with actual volumes that we're, with, we're trying to figure out volumes of spheres and stuff. I realize it is a lot. Anybody have any questions about what this is involving? I will save this PowerPoint from this point, from slide 17 on, gives you a, an idea of how to calculate what you need to calculate. Any questions about the calculations or anything I've gone to, through up to this point? Okay, we're going to get back into. Where will the slideshow be? <clears throat> uh, it will be where it normally is, which is in the PowerPoints. Hold on a second. Okay. Uh... Nope, that's not what I want. There we go. Okay, PowerPoints. In order to do this, I got to get rid of that right now. Okay, PowerPoints down here. Very bottom, it says PowerPoints. Click on it. Go back up to the top. I'm going to hit New, Upload Files. My computer, upload. Now I got to find it. Open. It's in there, okay? So now you can say for sure that it is in there. Now, and my wife is just making chicken marsala and I'm getting hungry. Is that, is that what's for dinner tonight? That is what is for dinner tonight. Okay. Let's look at the data table. All right. Now, you will be handed... You'll be given data. You will be given five measurements of sodium carbonate. You will be given one measurement of the volume and concentration of your acetic acid. You'll be given five diameters that you need to deal with. I would very much, guys, if I were you, I would print at least the data page out here. It's just going to it's going to be a good idea so that you can organize your your data as it's happening here. Now, the volume stayed the same for all five trials, so you're just going to put 100 straight across here. The moles, we didn't add any more volume, we didn't change the concentration. The moles of the acetic acid stays the same all the way over. Don't worry. Don't worry about this stuff. These next two are actual are actually what you would do if you were at, doing the doing the experiment in person. He gives you the mass of your sodium carbonate, five different values. You have to calculate the sodium carbonate moles. Sodium carbonate molecular weight is 105.55 grams. So figure out the moles for each one of your sodium carbonates. It gives you five more 
diameters. Moles of CO2 from the sodium carbonate. You're going to take the sodium carbonate, and this is not going to be as hard as it looks. The molar ratio between sodium carbonate and, and carbon dioxide is one to one. So whatever the moles you figure out here, the moles are going to be the same here. Your moles expected from the acetic acid. You haven't changed the volume or the concentration. So this is going to be the same all the way across. Only it was a two to one ratio. That's why the moles of acetic acid was 0 0.10 and the moles of uh, CO2 from the acetic acid is 0 0.050. This number, again, is going to be all the way across. You're going to compare them. The smaller one of these two is the limiting reagent. So whatever the limiting reagent is, like for instance, right here, we compared these two numbers. This one is smaller than this one, so you're going to put the limiting reagent number of moles of the CO2 expected in here. Whichever of these two moles is smaller, you're going to enter it into this line. Then you're going to use for this line PV equals NRT, or in other words, V is equal to, you're going to plug in these moles times R times uh, 298 divided by one atmosphere to get these. The volume of CO2 predicted, you are going to take the diameter, divide it by two, multiply it by four thirds pi r cubed to get the volume of the balloon. To the volume of the balloon, you add the 10 milliliters from the neck and 170 from the flask, and that will be in this particular space. Questions about the data table? I'm hearing crickets, so that either means you're really hungry and want to get out of here, or you're understanding. I'm going to think, I'm going to go with the misguided calculation that you're understanding things. I think it's both. Okay. All right, now, if you're down here, the data is right here, results. You click on that, and as I said, it's going to give you five amounts of sodium carbonate. It gives you the acetic acid, and then it gives you the measurements for the balloon. <clears throat> Results section. All right, first question, first trial. You have to figure out how many moles. That's why I told you to fill out that data table. These questions are going to, it's gonna be a lot easier if you have the data table filled out to complete these questions. All you gotta do is figure out how many grams of the sodium carbonate you started with, and how many moles that turned into. Question two, moles of acetic acid. All right, then you figure out how much CO2 that you, moles of CO2 you expected from the sodium carbonate. Same thing with the acetic acid. Then you're going to ask for that trial, what was your limiting reagent? Remember, this is the first one that you are calculating. There is already one that's entered into the data table. 
questions two through six involve the first trial that you were involved in doing the calculations. Then you got seven through, Twelve, the second one, 13 through 18. Third one, then we're going to continue on from there, guys. No real difference in any of these questions. All we're talking about is calculating each trial. All right, Professor, so question, what's the answers for uh, 1 through 30? Four. <laughs> Okay, well, we don't have to know um, how much the balloon weighs. Is that what? No, no, because remember in that, do you remember in the uh, uh, student data? Do you remember yes. I showed you the student data? He listed yes. there directly what the grams of sodium carbonate were. If you were doing this in real life, you would weigh the balloon, put some powder into the balloon, and then reweigh the balloon with the powder, subtract the two to get the weight of the sodium carbonate. Okay. This particular example, he just gave you the weight. So you do not need the weight of the balloon or the weight of the balloon and the powder. Okay, now we're all the way down to question 37. The ones previous to this are all the same questions, but they all involve a separate trial. Question 37, note, ladies and gentlemen, 50 points. Please don't fail to put this in there. It's the only one you have to enter. It's the only one I'm going to be grading. Actually, there are two. There's this one, and then there's another one. But what I need you to put in this box, are the five values you calculated that were actually produced. In other words, the values you're putting in question 37 are the values you got from using the diameter and the equation for the volume of a sphere, the 170 and 10. That's what goes into here. Stoichiometry problem for a post lab question. That's what we're doing with dealing with right now 30, 38, 39, 40, 41. These are all stoichiometric problems. Last, this is the last question you have to answer. And basically, all you got to do is put a number on there. It's really absurd for what we're doing, but do it anyway. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to put, when did the diameter stop getting any bigger? That's the first part. You get five points for picking a number, two through six. The second question. Why, basically it's asking what's the significance of the fact that the balloon started to say the same diameter? What does that mean? Sorry guys, I'm a bit stuck here where I'm at. And, okay, this is unfair because you guys have not had, some of you have not had ideal gas laws. Okay, what happened, what happened in St. Petersburg about two days ago, weather-wise? There was a storm. There was a storm. 
What happens to pressure when you have a storm? Is it at low pressure? It becomes charged. No, the pressure. Oh. Does the pressure change? Yeah, Does the pressure, pressure stay? Pressure. Does the pressure stay constant? No. So didn't we make an assumption no. when we were doing the ideal gas law that the pressure was one atmosphere? Yeah. Didn't we make that assumption? We did. Second, second explanation. What, what other thing did we assume? We assumed the pressure was one atmosphere and what else? Uh, stable temp. The temperature was 25 degrees Celsius. Okay. If you want to throw in a third one, balloons are never spherical. So that throws off a third one. Throw in two of those explanations and you'll get full credit. Now guys, if it's all the same to you, I'm gonna go have my chicken marsala. Anybody yeah, I need to go eat too. Anybody have any questions before I leave though? Yeah. No, sir, thank you. Okay, do you get enough Thanks, visuals? Professor. Yeah, I had enough visuals for tonight. I appreciate it. Hold uh, it, bro. Somebody have a question? Victoria? Nope. Oh, sorry, I thought it was your voice. Okay, guys. I have, I Go have ahead. A quick... Sorry, um, it's about question 37. It says like five different, it's asking for like five different results or? Yeah. I'm still confused. Like... Okay. Now, there are two ways you're doing this doing this calculation, right? You are using the moles from the sodium carbonate and the moles from the, H uh, the acetic acid to predict how many moles of CO2 you have, right? Okay. Then you're using the moles of CO2 you have to use the ideal gas law to predict the volume, correct? Yeah. Now, this is the other volume. This is the volume you're actually measuring. Do you remember I was talking about taking the diameter, dividing the diameter by yeah. two and multiplying it by four thirds pi r cubed? Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. That was the volume of the actual balloon itself. To that, you had to add the 10 milliliters for the neck and the airspace above the above the flask to the very top of the flask above the liquid and that was the actual volume of the experimentally determined amount okay okay does that make sense yeah good enough to do the uh, I'm sorry Anything else, guys? No, sir. Go eat, Jeff. Yes, sir. All right, Professor. Uh, thank you. Take care. Have this a good night, our... Professor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our yeah. next to last lab. Yay. Next week, next week we are doing titrations. The week after that. We are doing our lab final practical. Don't miss it. I have a for question sure. about that. Is there like a review for that or no? Uh, if it's there, then yes. Okay. If it's not, then no. <clears throat> Let me look. Okay. okay. Professor, I do have a cool question. If just between you and me, do you have a yes. second? Uh, if you can hold on until after I get done with these, these people. Okay. Yeah, well, it will just take a second, so it won't, you know. I'm sorry. An answer to the question about time. the gate, I'll be with you in a second. Okay. I'm going to stop share right now.
Okay, so I'm going to get into this. Uh, who asked the question about the review? Was that Mary? Me, Mary. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, believe it or not, I am starting to recognize some of your voices. Please say there's a review because if there isn't, that would really suck. Well, I'm not, I don't have high hopes. Yeah, I don't have high hopes either. And I'm guessing that there isn't one. In that case, Miriam, my best advice, and please ask me again this next week, my best advice to you, and probably the best way to study for this anyway, go back and review all of the experiments you did. Redo the calculations. That would be the best way for you to study for this particular exam. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm in here. Course content. Okay, are you seeing this along the side here, Miriam? Uh, you stopped sharing your screen. I did? Yeah. Nope. Nope, crap. <sighs> okay, you seeing the screen now? Mm-hmm. I'm going to have to get back in here because somehow I got out. Okay, look carefully at the table of contents. Not seeing anything so far. These are just the experiments right here. Yeah, there isn't. Well, relax. Looky there. <laughs> relax. <laughs> That's so annoying. Like, how do they expect us to remember like stuff we did like from the beginning of the semester? Oh, dear God. They actually expect you to remember. Oh, things there is a that? review. Okay, I there is. All right. I actually now, doubt it then. Wait, relax, relax. Be, don't get too excited. <laughs> what if it's like a really bad review? All right. You can answer that your question now. This is what he's telling you to need to do for the practical. Okay. Okay. There aren't actual questions regarding. Yeah. You're loud. Okay. Remind me next week, guys. Because if you don't remind me, I'll forget. And that means that it won't be allowed. He's saying I'm allowed, you're allowed to bring a reference page uh, for the lab practical. Yes. You're allowed to bring a cheat Yay. sheet. Cheat sheet. Okay, good. All right. You are allowed to bring okay. a cheat sheet. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Professor. You're welcome. Have a good night. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Anybody else out here? I got oh, yeah, three. Professor. I, is everybody? Sorry, Maverick. Yeah, I just have a... Maverick, are you asleep? <laughs> Maverick, asleep. you out here? Okay. Maverick, I'm sorry, but Maverick. I don't mean to be rude, but I have to get you out of here. Okay, Maverick's gone now. All right. No, no, relax for one second, please. Um, because I want to, I want to get Okay, that's what I wanted. <laughs>